Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Thank Your Pain podcast, where we take the painful moments in our lives and examine the lessons and blessings in them. And today, we are so blessed to have Johnny King with us. He's actually quite an idiot, quite a chill, yeah. little gender very, fluid Johnny very, King. Um, <laughs> Helping men to become kings. Helping Super. men to become kingy queens. <laughs> <laughs> Something we like intro the podcast like this because we are examining how men bond, but also just not taking ourselves so seriously. But truly, Johnny <laughs> King, he's a god amongst men. He has written the best-selling book, Becoming Kings, The Modern Man's Path to Being Powerful, Purpose-Driven, and Fulfilled in a World That Has Taught You Not to Be. He's a transformational coach, he's a speaker, and he has done presentations, coaching amongst many companies, leadership, groups, everything he's done it all he's a mm. red-headed white knight <laughs> <laughs> irishman yeah <laughs> irishman yeah. mixed with a whole bag of other ethnicities and thank you so much for being here today and for yeah. joining in on this humor that we're trying to produce <laughs> no it's good it's good and i like it because the brevity is you know you've been on so many podcasts yourself right and i think people any of us that have done enough of these like we talk about a story it becomes very could become very kind of robotic so it's nice to so just kind of shake things up, you know, and we get to see people's true personalities. So I just felt like you would be someone who I could do this with. We, I only yeah. talked to you when I was on your podcast, but I'm like, I wonder if I could just introduce him as a chode. And I sent you the <laughs> message. You're like, just go for it. Just, just do it. I don't care. Just introduce me. Say whatever you want. Yeah. And then when push yeah. came to shove, I couldn't do it. it it's interesting. Hard. Yeah. It's interesting though, as you kind of segue into that question of like, Guys just have this way of bonding through busting each other's balls. And yet, I've also grown up being super sensitive, super nice guy, super like wanting to please everyone. So when I started getting into this work and putting out Facebook ads or even just, you know, and then other guys rip me apart or rip other people apart that are commenting on my stuff. I was like, ah, like it. I was losing sleep over it, you know? And I think I've just learned over time to be like, no, nah, like be as, you know, non easily offendable as possible, you know, not take anything personally. So I was like, yeah, call me whatever you want to call me. Okay. Well, you brought just... up a good perspective. <laughs> How do you feel about Andrew Tate? Because he's like punching, everybody is the punching bag. Yeah. There's got to be like a line that's drawn between bonding by busting each other's balls and just like beating the shit out of people for no reason. Well, I agree. And I also feel like with a lot of quote unquote coaches in the men's, you know, movement, if you will, men's space, men's improvement space, there's just a lot of hyper masculinity and it comes off as just being a total alpha asshole, in my opinion. And I'm always kind of looking for like, cool, you can be a, let's say a military dude, a super alpha dude, but then like have a sense of humor. Like don't take yourself so seriously, but I think a lot of guys do and they just like it's almost like who can be the biggest prick that that turns me off personally. So I don't know, teach their own. That's can you dive was... more into that. Actually, it's very interesting because as a woman, I see that. Mm. And as a woman, as, as a men's coach, it's a little bit aggravating for me because somehow I got down the red pill wormhole on Instagram. Yeah. And, I, <laughs> yeah. and it was like, if your lady's acting out, just ignore her. Don't give any attention to that bad behavior and she'll come crawling back to you. And I was just like, there's just so much fucked up with this whole statement, yeah. you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. I feel like it, it pushes people away from empathy and compassion and like love and like, but somehow as men or, you know, an expression of masculinity, we've somehow lost the art of connecting with that, like deeper, more sensitive, vulnerable side of, of ourselves. And, and I think myself included and a lot of other men that I talked to, we've actually been raised by a ton of amazing women. We have sometimes over developed feminine expressions. We need to, we're confused with what masculine, true masculinity looks like. And I think that's why people are trying on all shades of <laughs> 50 shades of masculinity. And a lot of it is shitty and toxic and, and gross. And I think there's other men who are doing it beautifully and so i think it's it's everyone's trying on different sweaters if you will and some of them fit and some of them don't and some of them you know it's just like art it's like like i said it's an art so it's like some guys be like, oh, i really like how that guy shows up you know like even david goggins he like love to do but he's just so hardcore you know that i don't totally resonate with that you know I'm just at like at some eh. point you gotta like 
you know, it's okay to just chill. To chill and just enjoy life rather than always fucking pushing. And that's just why I feel like my brand and the way that I at least show up, I'm like, I, I just really am working. I've been working really hard to find that balance between, and I talk a lot about in my book is like the, the balance between as Tony Robbins talks about the, the science of achievement and the art of fulfillment. Like, but what guys are typically really good or the masculine, I don't even want to say guys, women who are more on their masculine can be really good at achieving as well. And then we always kind of wake up one day and be like, but what is this all for? And why am I so deeply alone or lonely, depressed? Yeah, all the things, right? So I think that that kind of goes into the whole, I mean, we can, like I said, go into tons of different rabbit holes, but I think that's a big part of just finding the balance between being a real dude who just is unapologetic about whatever makes you happy. And if you like to freaking color coloring books, then do your thing, bro. <laughs> like who cares, right? So I don't know. I digress. Okay. Well, and I love how you said that too, because I think, like you said, people get confused at the true definition of masculinity. And so they attach themselves to this hyper aggressive personality, which doesn't necessarily have anything to do with masculinity. And you could kind of masculinity from what I've seen is more of an energy as opposed to a character trait, just yeah. like Jason Momoa and The Rock can wear fingernail polish and you would mm -hmm. never question their masculinity, right? Yeah. But you would associate wearing nail polish with a feminine characteristic yeah. trait. So yeah. it's just interesting to see like hyper aggression being used as far as like, this is how you're a man. But when you do that, and for the example that I gave earlier, where they're like, just ignore your girl when she's upset or when she's acting out, all you're doing is withholding love from yourself because you're not allowing repair. You're not allowing proper communication. You're not actually doing anything. All you're doing is closing yourself off to feeling 100%. hard things. Which is easy, quite frankly. I think that's why guys do it. It's just easy to put on the blinders, you know, tunnel vision, stay focused on one thing, you know, and I did it in past relationships too, where I was just like, no, oh, I'm not going to re I'm not going to uh, react. I'm going to stay still. I'm going to stay, you know, and there's also part of me that, that emotionally kind of got off on be like, no, I'm going to be the rock in this. I'm not going to, I'm not going to stoop down to that level. I'm not going to get emotional, you know, because my, my brain kind of runs like oftentimes, especially growing up, it's like, what's, what's the point in getting emotional? Right. And I grew up with Michael Jordan and all these other huge mentors who were just like, they showed passion, even like Tom Brady's huge passion. But I was also kind of ingrained that if I ever let someone get my goat, quote unquote, like get into my head and be able to affect, you know, my psychology, then they had me, you know, they had me in checkmate. So I was always attempting to, to get into their head and have them kind of like in all the sports that I played, it's like me to try to like psychologically get into their head and ruin their game, you know, but it was always coming back to like, well, what's the point of getting emotional, you know, because if once I get emotional, then I'm out of control and I've lost the game. So yeah, especially in relationships with significant others in the past, it was like that thought of like, don't, don't let your guard down, stay strong, you know, but then I completely missed those opportunities to, to connect with such love and empathy that I've now learned from a lot of past pains, going back to what you said at the very beginning of your podcast. And unfortunately I've learned the hard way. So yeah. I was going to say, what an, what an exhausting game to have to constantly play, to have to like constantly be on it, to never be able to quote unquote surrender, because that is the beauty of vulnerability and the beauty of being in a loving relationship is you feel like you can trust someone enough to let your guard down. Like they've got mm -hmm. your back. You can sleep in the tribe and know that someone is going to protect you. And if you can yeah. never feel like that, because you're constantly think you have to win the game, like what game are you winning? Like the game of yeah. isolation and loneliness and, and yeah. solitude. Like, yeah. like you said, and like Alex Hormozzi says this all the time, 10,000 years from now, no one's going to remember who the frick you are whatever legacy you think you're building, whatever yeah. thing you're like yeah. trying to pass on to your children and the generational wealth, it's really not going to matter. And the sun is going to explode. We're all going right. to die. So like literally, what are you living for? Like what 100%. games are you playing? And like, what is the purpose and the point? Because there's, there's only so much money you can get before you're like, okay, what, what next? What now? Yeah. 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 And I like, I, I like what you just said, because I do feel like 
in my own journey over the last, let's say five years, especially as I've been getting older, you know, I talk to a lot of guys and there's just a lot of the the buzzword of legacy. Like, what's your legacy going to be? I'm like, man, who fucking cares? Like <laughs> you, Alex says 10,000 years, let's try 1000 years. Yeah. Like, unless we're a president of the United States, we probably won't be remembered 10,000 years from now or 500 years from now. So it's just like, you have to really, I feel like look at life as like, it's such a blessing that we are all crossing paths at the same time, different ages, different backgrounds, but like to actually be like those that are listening to our voices right now, like how, how cool is that? What a blessing that is. And if we can impart some type of wisdom nugget upon them, then cool. And vice versa. Like it's just a, a give and take of, of knowledge. That's, that's a really, really cool thing. But beyond that, like, do we really care about like being remembered or is it really about enjoying our lives right here in this moment? And I think I've learned, and I, we were talking about it even before we started recording, like spending time with my dad over in Europe more recently, like his health is a challenge right now. And it just, it just makes me realize how quickly life happens. You know, we're all blessed if we have 80 plus years. Some of us don't even get that. My mom passed at 61. It's like, man, that seems so young, especially as I get closer and closer to that. It's like, so then what, what is the end result? Like, what's the end game? What is this all really for? And I feel like that's the bigger question that men start asking, especially, well, it seems to be getting younger and younger, but in their thirties, forties, fifties, and like, I've done the programming, I've checked all the boxes. And then I wake up and I'm like, but I have all the things and yet I'm still deeply unhappy alone. Even if I have a wife and kids or a partner and an amazing life on paper. Right. So I've been leaning, which is a challenge because I've been leaning away from podcasting. I've been leaning away from social media. I've been leaning away from posting. And I'm like, I don't find this breathes life into me. What breathes life into me is like being outside, running trails with my dog, mountain biking, being with people, learning new things, going, traveling the world, learning new cultures, eating good food, dancing, listening to music. Like that's the shit that fires me up and everything else is kind of a distraction. So I, I struggle. I don't struggle. I'm just working through like maybe dissolving a smaller version of my ego that identified with legacy and wanting to be significant and wanting to be a big time coach and more just being like, and that's why I bought an HVAC business. I have Airbnbs. It's kind of like why I'm diversifying into stuff that Alex Ramosi talks about and Cody Sanchez would be like, just live, <laughs> live however you want to live. Right. And I think that's the whole point for me personally behind becoming Kings is like becoming Kings of what? kings of your life however you design it to be living from a place of like abundance and true like fulfillment and happiness and not just faking it love that that is so beautiful and such a a breath of fresh air to look at things because a lot of my clients who come to me are exactly what you described right yeah. they're late 30s mid 40s or 50s and they've done everything a b c d this is exactly what life told me to do in order to be happy and perfect and to be a man, so they've got the kids, they've got the job that's been there for 20 years. And they're like, I don't know who I am. Yeah. I don't know who I am. I've never done anything for myself. I don't have a purpose. I don't have a passion. And even it's sad to say, but even the people they end up marrying are just kind of the people that ended up being there at the right time mm -hmm. for them to fulfill that part of the mission. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really sad that it feels like society tells us to seek external things in order to become happy. And it tricks you into thinking that in order to be someone, you have to strive to create a legacy. You have to strive to create this wealth and abundance and success. And I think that people should, should absolutely try to live up to their capabilities, 100%. but not in absence of what makes them intrinsically motivated. And Correct. what makes them really happy. In absence for or in exchange for, right. like, yeah, what actually makes them happy. And I feel like that was what just being so driven primarily by my top need of being significant. It was like, oh, I want to be like Tony Robbins. I want to be. And then I've just started to like, like I said, the more and more quote unquote men's work, you know, that I've done and thank God for people like you and Trevor Boehm and so many other people that I look up to. Chris Bell, stuff like that is like so thankful that they're helping guide men 
because I think I was so lost. But for me personally, <laughs> the more that I kind of dissolve my ego and, and or just not even dissolve my ego, I don't like, I think I'm not even there per se, but letting go of that need to be quote unquote valued through being significant. The more I've been thinking, like putting on the hat of like, what would life look like if I was literally off social media altogether and no one knew how I lived? Would that be so horrible for me personally? And I'm not saying that should be for everyone. A lot, a lot of our businesses are built off of like being on social media a lot, right? <clears throat> but for me, I'm like, yeah, I think I could do that. And so I'm just feeling like things can change, right? But for me, for me right now, like one of my main focuses is like, you know, falling in love and starting a family and, and just being present to, you know, my wife and kids in the future and just not having the financial stresses that I felt like I just was always feeling when I was growing up, you know, and just having a dad and a mom who were like, not only actively participating in their kids' lives, but then they can have an example of like, mom and dad, who actually fucking love each other and they're yes. passionate and they're like, yes, we're their kids, but they actually realize that mom and dad's number one are each other, you know? where I felt like I grew up being that my dad's business was number one, that us as my, me and my four siblings were all my mom's number one. Right. So <clears throat> again, I'm going off on a tangent, but I do feel like as men, you know, especially if you have children that that would be my legacy, you know, that probably isn't remembered, but it's felt in a thousand years, you know, should my lineage continue going down. And I think that is, that would be for me the best thing that I could ever leave, you know, once my end of days come. That's beautiful. I'm so glad that you brought that up because I think that there's actually a lot of people right now going through this transition of like, what is the point of wanting to be significant? Right. And yeah. one of the questions I did want to ask you was where do you think the drive to be significant came from for you? Yeah, it's a great question. I would say, again, probably growing up and just without a real strong, firm male role model in tangible form, it showed up first and foremost as like He-Man <laughs> and then G.I. Joe and Transformers. And then it morphed into movies and Arnold Schwarzenegger and like building muscle. You know, it's a big part of why I still live today. It's not so much, it's become a good habit. But in the time it was like, this was my expression of masculinity, even though I'm super scared of uh, and have no idea of what being a man really is. But at least I know that a man should be well built. I don't know, should, should feel like a warrior, you know? So a lot of that significance was very shallow, it was just kind of based off of things that I grew up with, right? A lot of that significance was also built on, you know, I was raised by, like I said, my mom, my oldest sister, my school teacher, Sunday school teacher, my art teacher teachers. The only real men that I came in contact with were coaches of my sports, you know, but primarily I learned at a very young age to make my mom happy. Right. And if it wasn't my mom, it was all the way down the line to then girlfriends, then wife and blah, blah, blah. And it probably was, it a hundred percent was once I got a divorce at age 30, that that kind of really, really, really woke me up to, okay, I've been prioritizing significance and value external valuing of myself and this has blown up in my face you know because it just was never enough and so um and then i just really started to see that common through most people <laughs> you know so we i think we all kind of struggle with that in different ways you know it's kind of part of the, the human condition i think is working towards realizing that our towards self-love, towards valuing ourselves regardless of anything on the outside is probably one of the hardest things to do, but inherently is one of those things I feel like we're most capable of doing, you know? It's like the love of a parent, you know? Of like, love you 100% no matter what, even if you're a serial killer or the Unabomber, you know, or fly. Like, it's like parents typically, unless they're really, really... <laughs> wounded will love their kids no matter what. And I feel like that is that ability to love others is, is the same potential that we have to love ourselves. And it's truly important. Otherwise we just keep showing up in our behavior of like hurting future generations, you know? And it's like, we're either looking for love or we're looking to, you know, endanger other people just to like 
sedate ourselves or distract ourselves from the pain that we have. Of, like, are we truly lovable and are we enough for that love? So. And you brought up an interesting point though, about unconditional love from a parent. So I would love you if you were like a serial killer or the Unabomber. You should introduce me that way. Johnny's the, a serial killer. The serial yeah. killer Unabomber. <laughs> yeah, 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 no. <laughs> Who has unconditional love. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Check out we a have unconditional book. love from him. <laughs> yeah. For him. I just think that's an interesting point because I don't think I necessarily believe in unconditional love. And I think it can kind of be unhealthy because should you love your child if they become a serial killer? Is that, you know, like what, it, it just kind of bleeds into like the lessons that we are teaching people you know, like, and then what is the difference between unconditional love and then setting boundaries so that you can still be healthy? Yeah. Right. Because I think it's important to say this because I think there's also a lot of us as children out there that have not good relationships with our parents, but we're taught you should love your parents no matter what, because they're your mom or they're your dad. And we give our family members almost an excuse to be toxic or to abuse us because they are family. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's really important to distinguish the difference between knowing you can love someone, but also maybe having distance, knowing you can love someone, but also setting boundaries, knowing you can love someone, but maybe also just accepting that you're not going to have a good relationship with them. Right. Which is like right. a hard pill that I had to swallow with a few of my, you know, because I think we trap ourselves and we try and try and try. Right. And then, you know, you might have children and you're like, I'm going to do it totally differently. But that, that child is like a sovereign being. Like you're uh -huh. never, you, you are not a perfect person and that thing is not a perfect person and it's going to grow up however it grows up. So like, you know, you have to kind of have your mindset right on the way that, and you know, this kind of leads into male versus female. How are you treating your sons versus how you're treating your daughters? What are the mm. lessons that we're teaching them? Because it does start there. Yeah. Yeah. I, 100%. It's a huge, a huge question, a huge topic. And I certainly don't know the answers either, but I do feel like it's one of those things that you can simultaneously have in your life, right? Like I, I'd like to think of it as light being like love, right? You, could, for instance, you could you could stumble your way into a cave, a cave that's never seen an ounce of light. You could be complete pitch blackness, right? That cave has never seen light ever, and it's steeped in darkness, right? And yet, how resistant is it to light if you just light a match, right? So darkness, I believe, is only the absence of light. Light is truth. Light is love. Light is, in my whole opinion, like the synonyms of God, right? So it's only when we experience the absence of love or that light do we experience darkness or hell on earth, you know? And so I say all that because, <clears throat> because that is part of the human condition that people will fervently fight for. Oh no, there's hell. There's a hell and there's evil in the world. And me personally, I grew up as like, that, that, my, like that darkness can seem really, really, really dark <laughs> and really, really real, right? But sometimes all you need is one little tiny flame and then I have, bear, I have a bearing of how to get through that cave. You know what I mean? And so I feel like they're a way to simultaneously unconditionally love. Like I unconditionally love just human beings. You know, I just love relationships. I love people, you know, and yet there's a lot of people that I can't handle in my life. You know, like I keep my, my circle of trust super tight, you know, because I just don't have the time and the energy to to be a mother Teresa at this point. I'm not that spiritual or that evolved, you know? And so I do feel like there's a way to unconditionally love your children while also not being, while giving them the parameters of like, here's the playing field in, in which to, to, to play the game of life. But then also as a, as a loving human being and not being attached to an outcome of how they should grow up or how they should show up, Right. And that's how I've really kind of leaned into, leaned into relationships personally, both with my significant other and the way that I look to, to raise children will be like, I love you hundred percent. There are consequences. Like if you step out in front of a bus, the consequences that you're going to get hit by it, right? That's not my rule. That's just the, 
the rule of living on this planet. There's the rules of gravity. There's like, there's consequences to certain behaviors, right? And so a natural consequence is that if you lie to me, then our trust is going to be broken down, right? And you're going to have to work to build that back up. Or if I can't depend on you and you're super flaky, like I don't, you know, I, I can't keep putting my trust in you because it's, you know, kind of fits in that kind of realm of the the playing field. So that being said, though, I can still love someone I feel like unconditionally and shine light on them in, in the way that I kind of view life without completely giving up on them and then trying to punish them you know, for, for maybe not respecting those boundaries. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I think you highlighted though, a lot of men's childhoods and women's childhoods where parents were overtly controlling because they wanted them to have a better life and yeah. have, you have to live up to this standard or, or the classic, like, you know, oh, you got an A minus. Why didn't you get an A? Why didn't you get an A plus? And maybe nothing ever felt good enough. Mm -hmm. And it creates this perfectionism, this inherent, like, I'm not inherently worthy of love. I have to work for it. I have to be perfect in order to get praise or accolades. And that's where I think a lot of men also get confused at their motivation, because there's a, a lot of rhetoric around men are motivated by negative, negative talk, and women are motivated by praise, when it's actually scientifically proven that everyone is motivated better by praise. <laughs> so men are like, yeah, I just talk dog shit to myself in the mirror. Like you're a piece of shit. You're not worth anything. And then I go to the gym and I just kill it. <laughs> but you're just like, you know, they have like the lowest sense of self-worth on the planet. And you're like, yeah. okay, you don't get motivated by praise. Like get out of here. You know, like, yeah. Yeah. The only reason why I think that works is because they're actually changing their emotional state to being one of like aggression. And then, of course, it makes sense that they go to the gym to get the aggression out. And then they're like, yeah, I had a really good – like, so that's, that's just a, a, an unhealthy coping mechanism to, to hype themselves up. But I think you said something at the very beginning, and I had thought of it, and I didn't say it. You know, you very well may know this. You know, the feminine response to praise and the masculine response to challenge. And so I – when I started opening my gyms back in 2010, and I worked with women primarily for eight years until 2018 when I started working more with men – because again, I set up a business that really helped support my insecure ego, right? All these women that were just like my mom who had just passed away. You're so darling, Johnny. You're so great. Why are you single? Like, you're I don't so know, stop it. Yeah. You're the, you know, but that all started becoming kind of very stagnant and didn't, didn't fill me up. Right. <clears throat> but having said that, I still realized that I created a very successful business with women who hated the gym because I just focused on praise. I gave nothing but praise. I knew all these women by name. I just like constant praise and they were just filled up by it. At which point, once they had their love tank, quote unquote, filled, then I could challenge their masculine and be like, hey, you know, Elise, I feel like you could probably do that 20 pound kettlebell rather than that 15. And she'd be like, really you think so i'm like yeah i do and she'd do it and then she'd be beaming she's like oh my gosh you I know love your but interpretation she... <laughs> of she'd right? be beaming yeah like, yeah yeah but this is like the midwest. this is just like my mom you know is there a be... midwest did you grow up in the midwest yeah st louis yeah. Oh, yeah oh wow oh wow i'm yeah. from wisconsin originally so you know wisconsin. we gravitate wisconsin. towards each other wow yeah. why does yeah. everybody say that Wisconsin. Everybody always goes Wisconsin. I'm like, yeah. Wisconsinites don't say it like that. So everybody just makes this up who's not from there. Know. It's like an SNL skit. I don't know. Uh, uh, something probably. like that. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Continue on. Anyways, but to, but to that point though, um, you know, women, I pretty much built my business around women like my mom. My mom was kind of like my avatar, you know, just really insecure, had body image issues, overweight, middle-aged, you know, lots of kids, always focusing on everyone else but themselves. There's a lot of easy kind of like pivots right into men's coaching because we're all, we're all very, we just fulfill our needs in different ways, right? But with men, a lot of times... <clears throat> If you, again, if you challenge too quickly and they're feeling very, very low on the praise, they'll just break. You'll break rapport or they'll break emotionally and they'll walk out the door or they just will stonewall, that sort of thing. So I feel like with very insecure men, you, the way that I do it, I really do focus on a lot of praise, you know, but the whole way that men bond 
is through the, the, the ball busting are little challenges, you know, to see like, Oh, are you going to get sensitive and like break? Or can you, can you actually see the intent that I really like you, but I'm going to challenge you a little bit because that's what guys do. We're not, we're not mommies to each other. We're dudes to each other, you know? And I think that's how men inherently bond a lot of times going back to what you said earlier, but it is one of those things where, like I said, feminine praise, masculine challenge. We all have masculine and feminine, as you well know, and probably a lot of listeners do too, but it's interesting to see, you know, especially in relationships, because we can all feel that men can come home from an exhausting day or an exhausting business trip and be so empty. And she can be like, oh, finally, you're home. Can you go take out the garbage? Can you go, you know, fix the the gutter? Like you said, you did like, why? And just to be challenged. Right. And you're like, oh my God, like, no, like, get, let me, let me just get away, you know, versus being like, oh babe, how's your trip? And you work so hard. And thank you for you know, helping provide for this family. I don't know, like all the ways that, that men need to be respected and praised and honored, you know? And then from that point, can you challenge a man, right? Right. So but I would also say, not to interrupt you, but I would also say no. it happens in vice versa as well, where men don't understand that dynamic with women also. And so they will challenge their woman or pick on her. And I think that's where the thing like, oh, if he picks on you, he likes you. Like little kids don't understand right. the dynamic. So they're not like that. But like, a guy will bust his girl's balls and she's like, dude, why are you so fucking mean to me? Like, and he's like, no, I'm, I'm just like bonding with you, but not understanding the dynamic of like, she doesn't want to be beat down when you come home from work either. Like, she's not looking for that, you know? And so like, it's kind of interesting how we, how we have to look at the dynamics of a relationship when we're more aware of these things. Totally agree. And I feel like men actually are more at a loss than women are. Women inherently know that praise and love and vulnerability and, and support and nurturing all of that works for teamwork and bringing people together. And men are more lone wolves and they, you know, they'll tend to ostracize and push people away and challenge, like you said. So women then have to learn to put on their thick skin and then they'll start just like headbutting, you know? So then she gets frustrated. And so then it becomes kind of a, a a pissing match of masculine energy in a relationship, right? right. And you lose your polarity and then it's fucked. Well, it's hard too, because I don't think men are inherently like that. I think that they're taught to be that way. And then they don't yeah. know how to be some way different. And it's really hard. And this is comments that I get from women a lot on my TikTok, because obviously I'm a men's coach, but I get women on there who are all angry because they're like, you know, I try to be there for him. I'm doing everything and he won't open up to me. Or, you know, he like, you know, he's always so angry and like I'm there and they're trying to fix him. So that's a different problem altogether. But it's hard for women to, you know, they're, they're trying to get him to be vulnerable. But for all his life, he's been taught that that's not the correct thing to do. And he sees a problem and he wants to solve it by himself without including her in it because he doesn't want to come to her with problems. But that takes away from the relational aspect of of being with someone. Totally. And so... How do you feel like either men can start to let their person in to create a better relationship dynamic or how can women open up that space for men to open up? To Maybe the first question. question. Yeah. First question. First, I do feel like that's why men's work is so important. And so for me personally, getting away to men's retreats where there wasn't a single woman in the room, because even a single woman just changes things, changes the energetic environment when we were doing some of this really, really deep, like trauma work, you know, and to have men standing for you and supporting you and creating a quote unquote container of safety is really important for men to realize, oh, because men, I feel like, do feel like, uh, and this could be, a, I, I love your input on it, but like, I feel like women cha- deal with more guilt and men deal with more shame. And, and I don't know if that's accurate or not, but I feel like deep down underneath it all, men really, really struggle to feel like they're pieces of shit. Like they're really not worthy. And they, and I'm sure women feel this way too, but they're more likely to feel shame on a daily basis. Oh, I'm addicted to porn or I'm, I'm an alcoholic or, you know, I've fucked up too many women's lives and I'm a piece of shit. I'm not even... I think that's what drives the the statistics of six times more men killing themselves. They just they they think that the world would be better off without them, right? And I think that's so sad. And so the whole kind of shame part is like that that can only be handled 
that can only, you know, to take that monster of shame and to, to make it minimize it or to heal it is to, to shed light on it is to bring it out into the open, right? You have to acknowledge the shame, right? I think Brene Brown talks about that, right? And so I think a lot of that is done by men going away and doing their work, like away from home. And I think sometimes we as partners can become each other's therapists or coaches and like, you should do this and why don't you do that? And men are, again, men are so good at providing their gift of a solution that they can give their woman, you know, like just leave the job or do this or that, or you should be a, you know, if you do this, you should be a better parent. And it becomes really, that becomes really toxic. Cause then it's like, you're not really on the same team. You're kind of, I don't know, it's kind of like, you know, Michael Jordan was an amazing player, but a lot of his teammates said he was <laughs> really tough to play with because he was so regimented on like being the best. And I feel like sometimes guys can be like, that's, I just want to keep growing. I, and I fall into that too. I just want to keep growing. I want to be the best. I want to work for it. I want to be moving towards something versus maybe coming to your second question, which is more like leaning into like, and I just had Chris Bale on my podcast and and he brought up such a good point that it's really, and I've been ruminating about it since then. It's like, it's just about presence. Like men being present, not and women being present, all of us being present without, again, an attachment to we're going someplace or there's a destination or we need to get this, like just being present to whatever is, uh, loving what is, <laughs> quoting a, a book from Byron Katie. It's like, just I letting go. That. Oh, she's amazing. And I love that book. It's like just letting go and just letting things be, which is the hardest thing to do when we've grown up like holding on to control, right? And so I think there's a part of that too, that women can support their men by just backing off a little bit and just letting them have their space. You know, if you even read Men from Mars, Women from Venus, you know, so classic back in the 80s, but a lot of times it's like men give him space, you know? He's like a rubber band. He'll he'll pull away, but then the, the sooner you let him kind of pull away, the faster he'll spring back to you. Versus a lot of times he'll he'll want distance because the masculine needs autonomy and space to kind of find themselves. They have to go off into the wilderness, right? Where women a lot of times need to get together and they need to talk things through and connect. Oh, again, broad broad brushes, right? That men will more likely, more quickly come back to their loved ones you know, when they've done their workout in the wilderness. Right. <clears throat> so they, they do like, I do feel like there's a, a huge need for mentors, you know, men, men or women mentors, but men need to go away, do their work away from their significant other. <laughs> and then they can come back an improved version to see how they show up. But I feel like that's, that's one of the biggest keys I think is leaning into that work, you know, which is, challenging and courageous work to say the least. I couldn't agree more. I think everybody has work that they should do, even if they feel like nothing is wrong with them. It's just, there's nothing wrong with introspection and discovering and connecting with, you know, your own gender. I love that you yeah. said men need other men because obviously I'm a female men's coach, but I push my male clients like, Hey, you need to have masculine friendships. And I've had men groups and you know, like you said, even even the presence of a female energy there does change things. And I totally acknowledge that. And it's important for women too, even if you have a more masculine energy, which I do consider myself to have, to make girlfriends <laughs> and and bond with people of, of your own gender. It's it's just different. It's different to have that dynamic. So I'm really glad that you brought that up. I was just gonna say I was talking to my girlfriend the other day and I was and I was saying like she was asking me, have most have been most of your therapists and coaches been men or women i was like oh I've kind of been probably half and half but i will say i typically feel safer with women just because of the way that i was that i was raised one of my best coaches has been christine hasler who wrote the forward to my book i had her as a coach last year and i could have worked with her husband she's like yeah it's kind of a package deal work with me or my husband stephanos i never really gravitated towards him i just liked her energy but the work she had me do was still stuff that i had to do away from working with her. I had to do go I had to go into the wilderness and do my shit by myself regardless. So whether I'm talking about Christine or you or another woman, I've had amazing female coaches who've pushed me and seen so many scotomas or blind spots that men probably couldn't have seen as male coaches and then vice versa. That's why I just feel like there's so much I just love 
men and women so much that there's so much dynamic uh, and val- like value there that I think men shouldn't say like, oh, I can only work with men or I should only work with women. It's just like, just go with your gut, man. Like there's so much value to both. Yeah. Go with what you gravitate towards. Because if you're gravitating yeah. towards something, it's usually what you need in that moment. Yeah. hundred percent. Beautiful. hundred percent. Yeah. Right. So this has been an amazing conversation. I've enjoyed every minute of it from the comedy to the more serious. As we draw to a close here, is there anything that you would say as a, as a parting gift to our listeners who are maybe starting this journey or they're looking for the next step? I think it is, gosh, there's so much, but I do feel like it probably comes back to the thing that you just said, which is, it's just really easy when we're scared to be like, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm just going to, you know, like men can, and women too, we can all bury our heads in the sand, lie to ourselves. We don't want to step on the scale. We don't want to look at our bank account. We don't want to look at how empty <laughs> our spouse's love tank is or our, or our own, right? How much maybe shame there is. Like those things can be the darkness. Like I said, when we're in the dark, it can feel like the light of day will never come, right? But I do feel like if, if, and I got to imagine someone who's listening to this episode, there's someone who's obviously intrigued enough at least to spend their time when they could be doing so many other things, <laughs> listening to so many other things that uh, if they're listening to this and they haven't done a whole lot of work, then this, this is again, the blessing of why our paths have crossed, you know, their ears, our voices to be like, okay, this is, if, if I'm looking for a sign, this is it. Like do some fucking work. <laughs> you know, reach out to you at least like get like, just do a, don't you offer like a 30 minute free consultation, coaching call, something like that. Anybody can message me any platform and, and have a chat. Yeah. 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 So like reach out to whoever you resonate with and like have the courage to reach into reach. Yeah. Into it versus what I ultimately did was keep like downplaying, you know, like when I was married, just like, we should get some marriage counseling. I was like, no, we're fine. This is what we all go through. I was like rationalizing and justifying, minimizing it and talking myself into settling for mediocrity because I was fucking scared of who I would have to become to like rectify it. And I just waited until the whole thing blew up because I kind of didn't think it was going to blow up. I just figured like, but it wasn't just that of so many other things in my life, you know? So whether you've gone bankrupt or, you know, your, your spouse leaves you or your business blows up or your kids fucking hate you or like, don't wait (laughs) if you can at all, like, don't wait until the shit really hits the fan, work on some preventative care, if you will, and just start the work. You're already listening to this anyways, you know, like keep listening or ask about what other good books are, jump on one of your programs, sign up for a coach. Like that was, that for sure has been biggest needle mover for me is that since even before my divorce, like going to my first Tony Robbins event, I've prim- I pretty much have had some sort of a type of active therapist or coach in my life for the last 13, 14, 15 years with probably a year or two accumulative throughout the time period when I'm looking for a new coach, you know, it's just, it's just, that's just how I am. Like, why not get better if you can, rather than just pretending like, oh no, I'm good. I'm good. So that that's, you know, longer answer to your question like just have the courage to to reach out to someone who resonates with you get some support because the it's worth it it's totally worth it love that thank you so much johnny i could not agree more everybody listening make sure to get his book i'm gonna link everything below in the show notes his social media make sure to give him a follow and i just appreciate you so much for being here and we'll see you guys next time thanks for having me on